Well, welcome everybody. Thanks, Alice and Orlando. That was awesome. Love it. You know, they have two outstanding uh, children. They're young adults, and that's uh, uh, Liv and, and Adrian. We love them so much, and it's a great family. Um, great, great family, dear to us. And he's right. The fellowship is awesome. We love the fellowship. And so this morning, you know, it's important that we as disciples, this is our launching pad. So we come to church, and hopefully you can walk away with something you've learned today to launch you to have your church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, throughout the week with the people around you. Because you always have an audience when you're a disciple. There's always people that you're connecting to. So this morning, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, there's two of them, actually. How should we as disciples, you guys can cut through the this way, yeah, back that way and go around that way. That's why we have the curtain up so we don't embarrass people when they come in. Um, how do we live as disciples of Jesus? How do we live on this earth? And so one of the questions you have to ask yourself is where are you from? Now, depending on where you grew up, that is a life or death situation. Because when I say it like this, hey, where are you from? Oh, Camarillo. When I say, hey, where are you from? That has a different connotation. And I was asked that a couple times when I was growing up, some guy in a baggy T-shirt and baggy jeans goes, hey, Holmes, where are you from? And I was like, I'm wherever you're from. I'm from what your name. I mean, I was like, whoa, how do we? I, I didn't want to even answer the question because it's life or death. Say the wrong city and you're done. Where are you from? You know, there's this lawyer who goes duck hunting. He's a big city lawyer. And he's duck hunting, bird hunting. He shoots his bird and it lands on the other side of this fence that's not his property. And so he decides he's going to climb over the fence to get to the duck. And as he's trying to climb over the fence, the farmer pulls up in Arizona. It's an Arizona rural area. He goes, hey, listen, don't get going to be jumping over my fence. He's like, no, I'm going to get that duck. Do you know who I am? I'm the best trial lawyer in the nation. So I, I'm going to go over and get that duck. If you can try to stop me, fine. I'll sue you and I'll win. And I'm going to get the duck. He goes, obviously, you don't know how we do things around here in Arizona. We have a three kick rule. We each get eat three kicks each, and the one who quits first, then you can get your duck. So here's, here's the rule. And so there it goes, okay, I'll, I'll take you on, old man. But the old man goes, okay, I'm going to go first. Go for it. So the old man kicks him in the stomach. Ugh. Guy falls down, kicks him in the face. Ugh. Then with his work boot right in the kidney, boom. And the, then the lawyer's like, I almost quit, but you know what? Now it's my turn. And he steps up to the old man and goes, come here, old man. Old man goes, it's okay. I give up. You quit. You can get the, you can get the duck. <laughs> Where are you from? Because we're from Arizona. That's what happens. Did you know that in the state of Nebraska, the official soft drink voted on by the people of Nebraska, their official legal soft drink is Kool-Aid. I did not know that. Where are you from? Where are you from? Did you know in Delaware that chickens outnumber humans three to one? Three to one, chickens to humans. It is crazy. Did you know if you're from Ohio, your flag is not a rectangle? It's that triangularish triangle. People from Ohio know that's our flag, but it's the only flag in the United States that it's not a rectangle. Where are you from? And if you're from Minnesota, our dear brother Sean is, he'll attest to this. They have the most incredible 50 different species of mosquitoes. In fact, they'll tell you that their, their state bird is the mosquito. <laughs> different places do things differently. Jesus was from heaven, and he's always doing things differently. But that's not what we do things, how we do things around here, we would tell Jesus. You must be from somewhere else. You see, down here, Jesus, if somebody hurts you, you find a way to get them back. Down here, Jesus, you know, when you don't like someone, they're your enemy. And Jesus would say, hey, you got enemies? Love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. That's not how we do things around here. Down here, 
You get as many people as you can to try to serve you. That's greatness around here. And Jesus would say, hey, you want to be great? You become great by learning to serve others. Down here, we turn all sorts of good things into our things and make them idols. We turn things like money, sex, power into gods. And we live and die for them around here. And Jesus says to that, where he comes from, you shall worship the Lord your God only. Now, money, sex, and power are not bad. They just make terrible gods. That's what Jesus would tell you. Different places do things differently. And Jesus is from heaven. The question is, where are you from? You know, there's a movie. If you remember this movie, that's Kurt Russell, one of my favorite actors. And the movie is depicting an, an, an event during the 1980 Olympics. Now, if, you, if, if, you, if you're an Olympic fan now, we have professional athletes who compete in the Olympics now. But back in the day, there was only college athletes who competed in the Olympics. So the 1980 hockey team for the United States of America were college students going to play against the Soviet Union, who are all professionals in the NHL. College players versus professional players. And so uh, when he took over the team, the team was disorganized and disunified because the teammates hated each other because you had college rivalries. When they asked him, he asked them two questions. Where are you from and who do you play for? And one guy would say, University of Wisconsin, University of North Dakota, UMD Bulldogs. And leading up to the Olympics, they were not playing well because that was their attitude. And that's the kind of things and that's how life is done down here. Life down here on earth is played that way. For an example, let me give you an example. I'm an American and there are other countries I'm not a fan of, right? Or you can say, well, I'm a Republican and I don't really like the Democrats. Or I'm a Democrat and I don't really get along with the Republicans. Or I'm more upper class, so we really can't people who live off the system and when they should be working. Or I'm more lower class, and I can't stand those rich snobs and how they look at me down their nose. We can carve each other into groups. We can like some groups and not like other groups. There's religious, ethnic, cultural, and economic divisions wherever we go. When Ori says this fellowship is a huge, he's seriously right. It's so important. But here's what we got to fight against. The religious, the ethnic, the cultural, and the economic divisions. At the time that Paul was writing a letter to the Colossian church, and the church was divided into groups, and they were at odds with each other. Let me give you an example. Gentiles and Jew. Circumcised and uncircumcised. He's, he's talking to the groups in the church. The barbarians in the church. The Scythians. The slave or free. Multiple ways of dividing people into groups. And there's major religious divide between the Gentiles and the Jews, which also included the circumcised and uncircumcised. The Greeks, who thought they were cultured, they, they ran across these people that were, they, they said they talked like bar, 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 bar. Who can understand bar, bar, bar? So they called them the barbarians because their language was so funny and they were so uncultured. That's how they came up with the name. They never, the barbarians didn't call themselves barbarians. That's what the Greeks called them, the barbarians. Did you hear that foreigner? He sounds like a bar, 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 right? Then you had the Scythians. They were barbarous people. They were warlike people. And then you had the economics, the slave, the poor. Then you had the free Romans. All in the Colossian church. In the story of the gold medal, they were playing a mediocre team. They should have beaten, and they, and they tied. And after the game, the coach was so upset. He said, you don't want to work together? Line up. And he had them line up, and he'd go up and down the rink, all the way up and back. And he'd have the, he would have the assistant coach blow the whistle. Whoop! Up and back. Up. 
I'm back. Again. 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 This is after the game. Again. Again. So much to the point where the, where the assistant coach is like, I can't blow the whistle, coach. Again. For hours. And finally, one of the players yells, Mikey Rizzoni from Winthrop, Massachusetts. And the coach says, who do you play for? He says, the United States of America. Well done, gentlemen. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> he wanted them to play as one, to put aside their bigotry, their cultural differences, their universities, all the, all the grudge matches they played in college, put those aside because we are a team. And that's what the Colossian church faced. And that's what we face. We face political, socioeconomic, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. And if we let them, they will tear our fellowship apart. If we let it. That's how things are done down here. But that's not where Jesus is from. We put on Jesus. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you put on Jesus, right? You put him on. You put them on just like the scripture says. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. There is no Gentile. There is no Jew. No circumcised, no uncircumcised, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, and no free. Where are you from? Who do you play for? But Christ is all and is in all. So where are you from? That's a great question, huh? You know, I grew up the son, one of four sons of an immigrant family who ran away from communism in Nicaragua. That's my, that's my political, social background. Growing up, walking in the living room, hearing chants and political uproar. Latino is what they used to call us. They still call us Latin, South American. I was born here in Hollywood, California. Joined the army at 17. Not because I love my country, because I was trying to escape my house. But then I fell in love with the United States military. They taught me something. Fellowship. Teammates. You mess up, someone can die. It was, it was intense. I came back a little different, a little more humble. Where are you from? And how can you hate what's wrong and choose what's right? As a disciple of Jesus, we've laid aside our old self. And we put on this, this new self. And you've got to put off all these, all these labels that we are used to putting people in. And we have to put on a new identity. And that identity is Jesus. So long as you see yourself a part of this group, or which is way better than that group, or we're going to keep living the same, you'll still, you'll still serve the same idols. You'll still be making the same wrong decisions. Because you're living as if you're from around here. And Jesus is not from around here. Yet, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're no longer from around here. This world is no longer your home because he has, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Jesus is from heaven. He doesn't do the things, the, the, he doesn't do things the way things are done around here. He just doesn't. He lives a different way and we ought to live a different way. And you and I, we're a part of his kingdom now. So the message of Colossians 3 is this, is, is Christ reigns. He reigns in our life. He reigns in our hearts. You're in his kingdom now. So we live as citizens of his kingdom. Down here, people think that uh, in order to have success, I'm just going to run over more and more people. In order to have more fun, I'm going to do more and more sin. In order to have security, I'm going to store up more and more stuff. But we're not from around here. You're a part of his kingdom now. 
So think about the kingdom and you remind yourself who really reigns. Look at this passage here in Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and Christ, your life is now hidden with God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You better make sure you're on the right team. And you always can tell by what how you put what you put on. And sometimes for us, we put on those clothes every day. We wake up, we put on Jesus. So how can you hate what's wrong and choose what's right? Well, since heaven is, is our home, it affects how we think or it should, the good and the bad, the beautiful and disgusting. This is why Paul uses such, such strong language in the in this chapter. He he looks at this at sin. And the language he uses is how we should feel about sin, how, how we should fling it off and disgusting. You ever walk into a bathroom, and ladies, and you see a spider? You're like, wow, right? Or guys, you ever took that first, that first a spoonful of oatmeal or cereal, and you realize when it, your, when it hits your tongue that it's super sour? You're like, blah, blah, trash can. Someone killed a spider. We are disgusted with those things. I've had that happen to me. I look at the, I look at the date. It's within the date. <laughs> and it still was sour. And I spit it out of my mouth. Because I, it was disgusting to me. And that's how Paul describes our relationship with, the, with these, with these um, verses here. He's describing death and life. He's describing old clothes and new clothes. He has metaphors. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, that social, cultural, political world, and you become the son of Jesus in his kingdom. And we put to death the sinfulness that we have once lived and we thought was glorious. No longer. We take off our old self. This is the old clothes analogy. Our old with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed. You know, that spoiled milk analogy, that spider analogy. You know, in my house, when, 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 one of my, when my daughter screams or my wife gets, my wife doesn't scream as much anymore, but when my daughter's in the bathroom and she screams, I know what it is. It's a tiny little spider. Or it's a mosquito that's the big ones that hang out in the corner. And I like those guys because they take care of the little gnats. I'm like, that's our friend. No, it's not daddy, kill him. <laughs> so I got to go and kill all these mosquitoes. I'm like, just a... But it's the reaction to sin that I want to highlight here. Put to death. That New Testament word is like the Old Testament word when, when, they, uh, when the Joshua and, and the armies of God destroyed all the, the, the giant clans. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, rage, anger, malice and filthy language from your lips. Some of these propositions on this list here, you probably already hate. But there's probably also some sins on here you're having trouble hating. You might even have a liking to them. So you can start hating sin. You have to choose what's right. How can you as a disciple kill this in your life and fling it away as something disgusting? Well, the answer to both questions come from these. Where are you from? And how can you hate what's wrong and choose what's right? The answer to both of these is you're from heaven. That's where you're from. You're not from around here anymore. You're from heaven. So we have put on this new attitude, this new perspective, this new life. When we reflect on things above and not on earthly things, you're no longer attracted to sexual immorality, raging against people, abusing people, because you've experienced this thing called grace and mercy and peace as a citizen in God's kingdom. You've experienced that. So we no longer live this way because we're not from around here anymore. We're no longer from around this place. 
This place is no longer our home. But sometimes down here, sin doesn't seem repulsive when we walk around our neighborhoods and our, and our life. It's just the way things work down here because Satan is a talented liar. He's super talented. And that's why we must not forget that we're not from around here. And in light of heaven, immorality, greed, unforgiveness, they are as attractive as drinking motor oil. I would never do that. Although as a child, my mom would come in at night before bed at 9 p.m. and she would give me a spoonful of oil. I don't know what she was giving me, but it made me nauseous. I don't know what it was. If you experienced that, but she gave it to me every night where I had to, at 8.45, she, I knew she was coming in at 9. I had to pretend like I was snoring <laughs> just so I wouldn't get the oil. It was that disgusting. I was so nauseated. So I, I worked out a scheme where when I heard her coming to the kitchen over in the cabin, I knew what she clean, clean. I knew what she was doing. I was like, <laughs> so she wouldn't give it to me anymore because it was nauseating. And that's how sin should feel. It should feel nauseating because we're not from around here. We're from heaven. Hope you don't give your kids oil to this day. That was a 1980s thing, I think. My mom was just, she must have saw a show or something. I don't know what happened. Set your hearts. That's the answer, is set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. That's where you're from. That's where we're all from. Doesn't matter your socio, political, cultural, ethnic background. We're a part of this kingdom. We're here. We can actually enjoy fellowship and be from different cultures. And different backgrounds. That's the beauty of what Orlando said earlier in the welcome was the, the fellowship. And we can have this fellowship because those, those aren't the issues for us. They used to be an issue. Now today in America, man, there are definitely groups. There are hardened groups where I can't be your friend if you don't agree with me. It's intense. That's not us. Set your hearts on things above. Because Jesus is coming back. He's on his way. Heaven, it's on its way in its fullness. And that's your home. And it doesn't matter how things are done around here. We're citizens of Jesus' kingdom. And in the meantime, we as disciples live in this world like this. Like we practice heaven. That's how we live down here. We practice heaven. What's heaven going to be like? Well, we're going to practice that. We're, that's where we're from. So we're going to practice heaven. Here's how we do it. Set up time with someone. You know, when two people get together, the kingdom is there. So Jesus said, when two of you, I'm there. Set up time with someone. Set up time with someone that is not a disciple. Just to spend time with them. Just to love them. Just to hear them. Just to encourage them. Just to minister to them. Just to be there for them. Set up time with someone. You know, relationships are so powerful and people long for relationships. Set up time. And then, not just set up time, but keep up the relationship. Keep it up. It doesn't have to be every, every day, every week, but keep it up. Keep it up. I'm on Facebook trying to keep up my relationships. Like, like, like. Ooh, that's a sketchy post. Okay, skip that one. Like, 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 like. You know how it is on Facebook. It's, it's, like, it's like landmines out there. Woo, I don't want to like that. People will see that I like. Whoa, I'm not, not gonna, I'm not going there. Not going from, from heaven, from heaven, from heaven, right? We're from heaven. So we practice heaven. That's what we do. So set up time with someone and then keep up the relationship. Let's pray for our community. God, thank you so much for this awesome uh, experience to be in, in worship, to hear music, to hear our lives, just, you know, talking with one another, just being reminded that, you know, we're not citizens of the earth. No longer. We've put on a new identity, new clothes, a new being, a new perspective. God, strengthen us as we love each other, as we love our, our even love and pray for our enemies, God. Um, I pray that, God, that we'll have an impact on the relationships that you put around us supernaturally, just the people in our lives, God, that those are the ones who aren't disciples, God, that we'll, we'll be loving and we'll love them, God. We'll, we'll cherish the, the friendship and the relationship. And God, we thank you so much for what you're doing. And we thank you so much for Jesus who made all this possible through his death, burial, 
and resurrection. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Your life, church, and the world. Um, and it's kind of a recap. And the thesis for this, this whole book that I'm reading is money. Because we're not from around here. Money is for giving. That's not how the world thinks. Money is for spending. Money is for giving in God's world. It's reflected in the lives of and thinking of all the Old Testament heroes. And we've seen that God himself is the original and greatest giver. He gave the earth, its universe, to mankind. And after mankind's rebellion and the entry of sin in Adam and Eve, God did not abandon us in disgust. He called Abraham to leave his comfort and security because he was very wealthy and to live as an alien in a hostile land so that through him God could give blessings to all the nations of the earth. And Abraham received blessings so that he could be a blessing to others. Every last one of his sheep, goats, and even his children were dedicated to pursuing that blessing on his seed and then on to the whole world. And then David and Solomon, uh, they marked the high point of the monarchy and God's bringing forth the message to the nations. And the royalties from around the world would come and visit David and Solomon and to see what was God was doing in Israel so how they can align themselves with it. And David saw that all he had was because of his investment in that process of proclaiming the glory and the greatness of the Lord before the nations. And sadly, Israel quickly turned from, this is kind of a recap I've done for the last eight weeks, seven weeks. Israel quickly turned from God to enjoying the blessings as their, theirs alone and attributed the blessings to fabricated false gods who made no demands on them to love God or their neighbors. To fulfill his plan to bless the nations through Abraham, God was forced to discipline his people by cutting them off from the land and putting them back into captivity. But he did so with a view toward preserving a remnant from which his own son would come to fulfill the promises single-handedly. God never turned away from his purpose of giving, even though his people turned on him. He gave his only son in order to keep his giving program alive. We can now turn and see how this redemptive program was launched and how it prevailed in fulfilling God's commitments to give renewal and blessing to his sinful creatures, that's us, and even more dramatically, to transform their character, to conform to his, the original love-motivated giver. And that's why the Bible says that we are God's image. We're made in his image to reflect the heart and character of God. I said this before and I'll say it again. Not only should you be generous with, the, with God's kingdom and invest in our church, but you should be known as a generous person to everyone around you. You should be known as that person's a giver. He is generous. She is generous. Not just with the church, with your friends, with your family. Just being a generous person, it attracts people to God's kingdom. And that's what, they, that's what he was saying. That God blessed Israel and it attracted nations because of this generosity that God had toward his people. And they wanted to take a look. And the people abandoned God. They forsook him. They turned their back on him. They thought that all the blessings was for them alone. And so I want to call us to be the most generous people on the earth. You don't have to be wealthy to be generous. That's a, that's a misnomer. Generous people, so the most generous people aren't even the wealthiest people. Right? So let's pray for a contribution. God, thank you for this opportunity to give and opportunity to um, express our gratitude and, and also express our generosity, God. We love it. We're so grateful for the generous offerings of the disciples, God. We pray for those who are not participating in it, God, that they would pray about that and participate in this amazing um, opportunity to really reflect the greatest original giver, and that's you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's uh, three ways to do it. You can do it online. Remember, if, if, I, if you do it the, the, this texting way, make sure there's no space between Shoreline COC. Otherwise, you will bless Austin, Texas. Okay? It's another Shoreline church. I don't know why they call themselves Shoreline. They're inland. Doesn't make sense to me. But that's what they call themselves. I'm tempted to call the minister there one day because I've donated them by accident. You know, I've done that. But 
On the top left, you'll see the LA symbol, and they have a different, they have an A symbol, which stands for Austin. So those are three ways to donate. So please 